This is my first time at TED. Normally, as an advertising man, I actually speak at TED Evil, which is TED's secret sister organization that, that pays all the bills. Uh, it's held, held every two years in Burma. Um, and I, uh, I particularly remember a really good speech by Kim Jong-il on how to get teens smoking again. Um, but actually, it's suddenly come to me after years working in the business that what we create in advertising, which is intangible value, you might call it perceived value, you might call it badge value, subjective value, Intangible value of some kind gets rather a bad rap. If you think about it, if you want to live in a world in the future where there are fewer material goods, you basically have two choices. You can either live in a world which is poorer, which people in general don't like, or you can live in a world where actually intangible value constitutes a greater part of overall value. That actually intangible value in many ways is a very, very fine substitute for using up labor or limited resources in the creation of things. Uh, here's one example. This is a train which goes from London to Paris. The question was given to a bunch of engineers about 15 years ago. How do we make the journey to Paris better? And they came up with a very good engineering solution, which was to spend £6 billion building completely new tracks from London to the coast and knocking about 40 minutes off a three-and-a-half-hour journey time. Now, call me Mr. Picky. I'm just an ad man. But it strikes me as a slightly unimaginative way of improving a train journey, merely to make it shorter. Now, what is the hedonic opportunity cost of spending £6 billion on a load of railway tracks? Here's my naive advertising man's suggestion. What you should, in fact, do is employ all of the world's top male and female supermodels, pay them to walk the length of the train, handing out free Chateau Petrousse for the entire duration of the journey. <laughs> um, now, you're still... You'll still have about three billion pounds left in change, and people will ask for the trains to be slowed down. <laughs> now, here's another naive advertising man's question again. And this shows that engineers, medical people, scientific people have an obsession with solving the problems of reality. When actually most problems, once you reach a basic level of wealth in society, most problems are actually problems of perception. So I ask you another question. What on earth's wrong with placebos? They seem fantastic to me. They cost very little to develop. They work extraordinarily well. Um, they have no side effects, or if they do, they're imaginary, so you can safely ignore them. <laughs> so I was discussing this, and I actually went to the, the Marginal Revolution blog by Tyler Cowan. I don't know if anybody knows it. Someone was actually suggesting you could take this concept further and actually introduce placebo education. The point is that education doesn't actually work by teaching you things. It actually works by giving you the impression that you've had a very good education, which gives you an insane sense of unwarranted self-confidence, which then makes you very, very successful in later life. So, uh, welcome to Oxford, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now, but actually the point, the point of placebo education is interesting. How many problems of life can be solved actually by tinkering with perception rather than that tedious, hard-working and messy business of actually trying to change reality? A great example from history. I've heard this attributed to several other kings, but doing a bit of historical research, it seems to be Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great of Prussia was very, very keen for the Germans to adopt the potato and to eat it because he realised that if you had two sources of carbohydrate, wheat and potatoes, you get less price volatility in bread and you get a far lower risk of famine because you actually had two crops to fall back on, not one. The only problem is potatoes, if you think about it, look pretty disgusting. And also, 18th century Prussians ate very, very few vegetables, uh, rather like contemporary Scottish people. And so, um, <laughs> so actually, he tried making it compulsory. The Prussian peasantry said, we can't even get the dogs to eat these damn things. They're absolutely disgusting and they're good for nothing. There are even records of people being executed for refusing to grow potatoes. So he tried plan B. He tried the marketing solution, which is he declared the potato was a royal vegetable and none but the royal family could consume it. And he planted it in a royal potato patch with guards who had instructions to guard over it night and day, but with secret instructions not to guard it very well. <laughs> Now, 18th century peasants know there's one pretty safe rule in life, which is if something's worth guarding, it's worth stealing. Before long, there was a massive underground potato growing operation in Germany. What he'd effectively done is he'd rebranded the potato. It was an absolute masterpiece. I told this story, and a gentleman from Turkey came up to him and said, very, very good market of Frederick the Great, but not a patch on Ataturk, he said. Ataturk, rather like Nicholas Sarkozy, was very keen to discourage the wearing of the veil in Turkey to modernize it. 
Now, boring people would have simply banned the veil, but that would have ended up with a lot of awful kickback and a hell of a lot of resistance. Ataturk was a lateral thinker. He made it compulsory for prostitutes to wear the veil. <laughs> now... <laughs> I can't verify that fully, but it doesn't matter. There's your environmental problem solved, by the way, guys. All convicted child molesters have to drive a Porsche KN. <laughs> um, what Ataturk realised, actually, is two very fundamental things, which is that, actually, first one, all value is actually relative. <laughs> all value is perceived value. For those who don't speak Spanish, Huda Naranja is actually the Spanish. This is actually, it's not the dollar, it's actually the peso in Buenos Aires. A very clever uh, Buenos Aires street vendor has decided to practice price discrimination to the detriment of any passing gringo tourists. As an advertising man, I have to admire that. But the first thing is all value, all value is subjective. Uh, second point is that persuasion is often better than compulsion. These funny signs that flash your speed at you, some of the new ones on the bottom right now actually show a smiley face or a frowny face to act as a little emotional trigger. What's fascinating about these signs is they cost about 10% of the running cost of a conventional speed camera, but they prevent twice as many accidents. So the bizarre thing, which is baffling to conventional, classically trained economists, is that a weird little smiley face has a better effect on changing your behaviour than the threat of 60 pounds of fine and three penalty points. Tiny little behavioural economics detail. In Italy, penalty points go backwards. You start with 12 and they take them away because they found that loss aversion is a more powerful influence on people's behaviour. In Britain, we tend to feel, whoa, got another three. Not so in Italy. Another fantastic case of creating intangible value to replace actual or material value, which remembers what, after all, the environmental movement needs to be about. This again is from Prussia, from, I think, about 1812, 1813. The wealthy Prussians, to help in the war against the French, were encouraged to give in all their jewellery, and it was replaced with replica jewellery made of cast iron. Here's one, gold gabi for Eisen, 1813. The interesting thing is, for 50 years hence, the highest status jewellery you could wear in Prussia wasn't made of gold or diamonds, it was made of cast iron. Because actually, never mind the actual intrinsic value of having gold jewellery, this actually had symbolic value, badge value. It said that your family had made a great sacrifice in the past. So the modern equivalent would, of course, be this. <laughs> But actually, there is a thing, just as there are Veblen goods, where the value of the good depends on them being expensive and rare, there are opposite kind of things, where actually the value in them depends on them being ubiquitous, classless and minimalistic. If you think about it, Shakerism was a proto-environmental movement. Adam Smith talks about 18th century America, where the prohibition against visible displays of wealth was so great, it was almost a block on the economy in New England, because even wealthy farmers could find nothing to spend their money on without incurring the displeasure of their neighbours. It's perfectly possible to create these social pressures which lead to um, more egalitarian societies. What's also interesting, if you look at products that have a high component of what you might call messaging value, a high component of intangible value versus their intrinsic value, they are often quite egalitarian. In terms of dress, denim is perhaps the perfect example of something which replaces material value with symbolic value. Coca-Cola, a bunch of you may be a load of pinkos, and you may not like the Coca-Cola company, but it's worth remembering Andy Warhol's point about Coke, where what Warhol said about Coke is he said, what I really like about Coca-Cola is the President of the United States can't get a better Coke than the bum on the corner of the street. Now, that is actually, when you think about it, we take it for granted, it's actually a remarkable achievement to produce something that's that democratic. Now, we basically have to change our view slightly. There's a basic view that real value involves making things, it involves labour, it involves engineering, it involves limited raw materials. And that what we add on top is kind of false, it's a fake version, and, and, and there's a reason for sort of suspicion and uncertainty about it. I mean, it, it patently it, it veers towards propaganda. However, what we do have now is a much more variegated media ecosystem in which to kind of create this kind of value, and it's much fairer. When I grew up, this is basically the media environment of my childhood as translated into food. You had a monopoly supplier. On the left, you have Rupert Murdoch or the BBC. Um, <laughs> and on your right, you have a dependent public which is pathetically grateful for anything you give it. Um, <laughs> nowadays... Nowadays, the user is actually involved. This is actually what's called, in digital world, user-generated content, although it's called agriculture in the world of food. <laughs> this is actually called a mashup, where you take content that someone else has produced and you do something new with it. Uh, in the world of food, we call it cooking. Um, this is food 2.0, which is food you produce for the purpose of sharing it with other people. 
This is mobile food. Uh, British are very good at that. Fish and chips in newspaper, the Cornish pasty, the pie, um, the sandwich. We invented the whole lot of them. We're not very good at food in general, but Italians do great food, but it's not very portable, generally. <laughs> I, I, I've, I only later discovered that the Earl of Sandwich didn't invent the sandwich, he actually invented the toasty, but then the Earl of Toasty would be a ridiculous name, frankly. <laughs> Finally, we have contextual communication. Now, the reason I show Perno, it's only one example. Every country has a contextual alcoholic drink. In France, it's Perno. It tastes great within the borders of that country, but absolute shite if you take it anywhere else. <laughs> um, uh, Unicum in Hungary, for example. The Greeks have actually managed to produce something called Retsina, which even tastes shite when you're in Greece. Um, but so much communication now is contextual that the capacity for actually nudging people, for giving them better information... Uh, BJ Fogg at the University of Stanford makes the point that actually the mobile phone is, is... He's invented the phrase persuasive technologies. He believes the mobile phone, by being location-specific, contextual, timely and immediate, is simply the greatest persuasive technology device ever invented. Now, if we have all these tools at our disposal, we simply have to ask the question, and Thaler and Sunstein have, of how we can use these more intelligently. I'll give you one example. If you had a large red button of this kind on the wall of your home, and every time you pressed it, it saved $50 for you, or put $50 into your pension, you would save a lot more. The reason is that the interface fundamentally determines the behavior. Okay? Now, marketing has done a very, very good job of creating opportunities for impulse buying. We've never created the opportunity for impulse saving. If you did this, more people would save more. It's simply a question of changing the interface by which people make decisions. And the very nature of the decisions changes. Obviously, I don't want people to do this, because as an advertising man, I tend to regard saving as just consumerism needlessly postponed. But, but, but if, if, um, if anybody did want to do that, that's the kind of thing we need to be thinking about, actually. Fundamental opportunities to change human behavior. Now, I've got an example here from Canada. Um, uh, there was a, a young intern at Ogilvy Canada um, called um, Hunter Somerville, who was working in improv in Toronto and got a part-time job in advertising, and was given the job of advertising shreddies. Now, this is the most perfect case of creating intangible, added value, without changing the product in the slightest. Shreddies is a strange, square, whole-grain cereal, only available in New Zealand, uh, Canada, and Britain. It's Kraft's peculiar way of rewarding loyalty to the crown. Um, <laughs> and um, in working out how you could relaunch Shreddies, he came up with this. <laughs> Shreddies are supposed to be square. Shakes, <laughs> New Diamond Shreddy cereal. Same 100% whole grain wheat in a delicious diamond shape. No. I'm not sure this is the most perfect example of intangible value creation. All it requires is photons, neurons, and a great idea uh, to create this thing. And I have to say, it's a, it, it's a work of genius, but naturally, you can't do this kind of thing without a little bit of market research. Uh, so Shreddies is actually introducing a, a new product, which is something uh, very exciting for them. So they're introducing new diamond Shreddies. Isn't interesting? Um, so I just want you to... Uh, box there, so I just want to get your first impressions when you see that, and you see the diamond uh, Shreddy box there. They're a little bit confused. They look like squares they, they, it's, it's all, yeah, it's all in the appearance, but it's kind of like thinking about uh, a six or a nine, like a six. Flip it over, it looks like a 9, but it's, the 6 is very different from a 9. And I'm in a W, exactly. Actually, when you don't see it, like when I saw it there, you just look like you turn around at the end, but when you see it like that, it's more interesting looking. Like just try both of them. Take a square one there first. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, they're the same thing. Yeah, it's the Actually, actually, debate raged. There were conservative elements in Canada, unsurprisingly, who actually resented this intrusion. So eventually the manufacturers actually arrived at a compromise, uh, which was the combo pack. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, <laughs> if you 
think it's funny, bear in mind there's, there's an organisation called the American Institute of Wine Economics, which actually does extensive research into perception of things and discovers that except for among perhaps 5 or 10% of the most knowledgeable people, uh, there is no correlation between quality and enjoyment in wine, except when you tell the people how expensive it is, in which case they tend to enjoy the more expensive stuff more. Um, so drink your wine blind in future. But this is both hysterically funny, but I think an important philosophical point, which is going forward, we need more of this kind of value. We need actually to spend more time appreciating what already exists and less time agonizing over what else we can do. Two quotations to more or less end with. Uh, one of them uh, is poetry is when you make new things familiar and familiar things new, which isn't a bad definition of what our job is to help people appreciate what is unfamiliar, but also to gain a greater appreciation and place a far higher value on uh, those things which are already existing. There's some evidence, by the way, that things like social networking help do that because they help people share news. They give badge value to everyday little trivial activities. So they actually reduce the need for actually expending great money on display and increase the kind of third party enjoyment you can get from the smallest, simplest things in life, which is attractive. The second one is the second GK Chesterton quote of the session which is we're perishing for want of wonder, not for want of wonders, which I think for anybody involved in technology is perfectly true. And a final thing, when you place a value on things like health, love, sex, and other things, and learn to place a material value on what you've previously discounted for being merely untangible, a thing not seen, you realize you're much, much wealthier than you ever imagined. So thank you very much indeed.